of God. Well, God bless you. Thank you for inviting us into your life. This opportunity to speak is a tremendous honor. We don't take it for granted. We believe that God's got a good word for you. Give an ear to hear what the Spirit of God says, and we believe that you will be blessed. Amen? Open with me in your Bible, if you would, to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. As we start, I want you to know, I believe I've heard from God. We finished the series last week, and I had been seeking God about what to minister next. And I want to talk about this one word called mammon. Mammon. Jesus used this word in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 24. You might be very familiar with it. Jesus said, no man or no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What is mammon? Somebody said money. How do we know? Where do we get that? But one thing we do know is that you can't serve God and mammon. And so I want to talk to you about this one word today called mammon. Do you serve God or mammon? Because according to Jesus, you can't successfully do both. Now, I don't know about you. Um, I've had multiple jobs. I've worked two jobs at a time. I remember I was in college. I worked three jobs. I remember sitting at a stop and stoplight, fell asleep. <laughs> you know, just working, work, work security overnight, work lifeguard during the day, just working, working, working. Well, I mean, I was able to do it. But Jesus said, no man can do it. So either I don't understand what he's saying, or he is wrong. Well, we already know he wasn't wrong. Because if Jesus, if God says you can't do it, you can't do it. And really, if you understand it the right way, he's saying no man can successfully serve two masters. Either he's going to love one and hate the other. He's serving them both, but he likes this one, don't like that one. He's going to hold the one, and really, I can't stand this other one. Wish he could have it out of his life. But you can't do both successfully. But how do you determine if you are serving mammon? In, in, in order to answer that question, you have to know what, or in this case, who mammon is. Because, you know, serving things is not necessarily the context. He says you can't do both. You can't serve God and mammon. So, you need to know what is mammon, or as he's putting it, who is mammon? Is mammon a who? You also need to know what it looks like to serve mammon, or to try to serve God and mammon. So I'm going to ask you something that I did last week. Thank you. I'm going to ask you something that I did last week that I really think is important. Because if you're like me and you hear this off the surface, you think, well, I serve God. If I would ask for the show of hands, I mean, we came to church because we love God, we worship God, we serve God. I, I, I want you to slow down and don't be so quick to answer these questions that I put before you and you dispose yourself from the message that God is sending and bringing to you today. 
There's something about mammon that is so serious that Jesus is bringing this to our attention. You remember the Ten Commandments? In Exodus chapter uh, 20 and verse 3 and 4, do you all remember the Ten Commandments? God said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Commandment number one. And if you grew up back in my time, you remember the movie Ten Commandments? Man, he said that with sound effects. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. 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 He said it with an echo. <laughs> Commandment number two. You shall make yourself no carved image. <laughs> anything, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, and that is the water under the earth, that's commandment number two. It seems like really one long commandment, but then it wouldn't be the Ten Commandments. It would be like the Seventh Commandment. Anyway, come on, somebody. But these are three separate commandments, all as, it, all as it relates to you not worshiping or serving any other God but our God. We were reading in our chapters. If you read your chapter, and I encourage you to do so, we were reading in the chapter just the other I don't remember which one it was, but I remember what he said. God himself, through the prophet, I believe it was Isaiah, said, there are no other gods besides me. You know, are, there are many gods. No, there are no. There are. He is the only true and living God. All else would be at least considered a false god, and in that are no gods. There's only one self-existent one. There's only one who's all-powerful. There's only one who's all Commandments to us are to not have anything or anyone else in our life that we bow down to and serve as a God. I got this graphic image, and it perfectly depicts a powerful word from the Lord. What, I, what I've seen in the last 48 hours has revolutionized my thinking about this one verse of Scripture. And I want to challenge you, don't just pass off Jesus essentially makes a statement in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24 that puts the issue on the same level as what we see in the Ten Commandments. So what is mammon? I've said and heard for years that mammon is money. I've heard it in pulpits. I myself, even from this pulpit and in my own personal life, when I read the Bible and I come to this particular verse, I know you shall not God serve God and money. Because I was taught, as far as I could understand, mammon is money. Money is mammon, mammon is money. And you can just interchange it, and that's what it meant. But that's not what it means. This is something serious. Recently, I was at a minister's conference, and I heard Dr. Creflo Dollar minister on the subject of mammon in a way that I had never heard before. And I didn't just take it because he preached it. I'm not even preaching what he preached in its specifics. But I saw that there's something about mammon that I don't know. One of my pastors taught me, never take the word of a preacher. He went on to say that if he can't show you in the word of God, then you have no obligation to do it. But if you see it in the word of God, you have every responsibility to perform. But you don't just take somebody else's word. Jesus said, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word, let it be established. Right? So, do you know what mammon is? Or do you even care? Because your Lord, if you call him Lord, your Savior, talking to you, warns you about serving him and serving this thing called mammon. Are you all ready for this today? It's a word that's hardly used in the Bible. It's only three times, and it's essentially from the same occasion, one same 
instant, recorded by two different people. Matthew recorded it in verse 24 of chapter 6. Luke also recorded the same thing, but he added a different perspective. Luke heard something that Matthew didn't hear, and he used this word mammon. In the book of Luke, chapter 16, this is the second time that we see it in the, in, in, in the Bible. In Luke 16 and 9, Jesus said, and I say to you. Now, now look, look up at me for a moment. When you read your Bible, read it as God speaking to you. Don't read it like a history book or a newspaper. Number one, the newspaper probably ain't true. And don't just read it as a history book. Read it as if it were God talking to you about something specific. Well, Jesus is talking to, to us, and he says, and I say to you, make friends of yourselves unto unrighteous mammon. I always put it with money. Make fr- you know, how many of y'all know it's good to have friends with money? That when you fail, they may receive you in an everlasting home. But he didn't say money. He said mammon. The other time that he used it, in verse 11, just two verses down from that, therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, I always translated in my mind, money. But is it? Am I just taking somebody else's understanding? Or do I know what this is? Because I don't want to be in a position where I'm served, trying to serve God unsuccessfully and trying to serve mammon unsuccessfully. He says, if you've not been faithful to unrighteous mammon, who will commit your trust? The true riches. So there must be something about mammon and riches that are connected or intersect because if you can't do this, then how are you going to do that? The last time that it's used, this is the fourth time now, in verse 13, he says, no one or no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise. That's a different word there, right? But it's essentially the same as Matthew 6, 24, but we didn't get those other two verses, so essentially you could say it was only used three times by Jesus. You cannot serve God and mammon. So what is mammon? I do what I do. I was inspired. The Spirit of God showed me that there's something about this that I need to get and give to you. And here it is. I looked it up in the Strong's Concordance of the Bible. Mr. Strong was a Greek scholar, studied and translated the Greek into English so that we would understand when an English word is in the, Jesus didn't speak English, by the way, you know, if you didn't know. I don't know if he spoke Greek or wrote in Greek, but Greek was the language of the land at the time that Jesus was on the earth. So when they wrote something, when Matthew wrote it, he wrote it in Greek, not Hebrew. I believe Jesus spoke Hebrew, that's his native language. But when that Greek word many years ago was used, mammon, it had a meaning that the people understood. I wonder if you understand. This word mammon, in its origin, word that came from a word, the original word meant confidence, i.e., which is, that is, wealth personified. How do you personify wealth? Mammonos is what it means. It comes from mammon, means mammonos. It means that is avarice. Now, if I got that wrong, listen, I'm tired and I don't really want to hear that today. But I'm going to call it avarice. And it uses another word that caught my attention over the last several weeks I've been studying this, deified. This word mammonos means something that's deified or worshipped. Then Thayer's also did a study in the Greek to English to help us understand. And Thayer's, where this word mammonos from the Greek, it means it's referring to something that is trusted in. What is trusted in? Well, people trust in their treasure. You know, scripture says some trust in horses, some trust in chairs, but I'll trust in. So when you talk about mammonos, you're talking about something that is trusted in, treasure, riches, and then check this out. Here it is again, where it is what? Personified and in opposition to God. 
And then when you look at the outline of Bible usage, one more definition to help. How is this word mammon used in the Bible? Well, when it's used, it's talking about mammon, which we're trying to figure out. It talks about treasure when it's used. It talks about riches. Okay, now we see where he went in Luke. But again, he, in the, in the outline of the Bible, talked about riches where it is, say it with me, personified and opposed to God. I was meditating. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to understand it so I can share it with you so you can even teach it to others. I'm trying to, so you can get it in all, get wisdom in all you're getting, get an understanding. Because if you're like so many, you come in, you know, you cannot serve God in money. Well, I serve God, so I must not serve money. But is that automatic? Because Jesus is warning something. One of the most powerful passages of Scripture. We need to make sure that we're not like that image where we're bowing down before two instead of one. So I'm meditating on these deity, this personified, and I'm like, man, money. So this is the working definition that I want to use, and we're going to see if it's balanced from the word of God. Mammon, for me, at this point, equals, listen to this, money personified. So I was coming back from camp. I'm tired. We sleep very little at night, two days in a row. I'm driving, traffic slowing down, just want to get home, get in the shower. And I'm starting to meditate on what to say today. I almost wanted to play a video. You, you know, you go to school, you have a video church. <laughs> it's like, oh, I, I don't want to go sit down. I don't want to do nothing, Jesus. <laughs> And so I'm driving, and I is amazing. So check this out. I'm driving, and I'm, I'm meditating on money personified, because everything I've studied over the last several weeks is leading me in that direction. It's, it's not just money, but it's money. And in my mind, I'm like, how do you personify money? And so in my mind, I saw the, the image of a human being but made of money. And I, cause you know, I usually try to get a graphic to kind of, you know, just kick the thing off. Man, I just Googled money personified and this picture popped up. Now the picture makes a different impact than when you first saw it because from the root of what this is, it's the picture of what Jesus is saying, don't do that. Money spiritualized or personified. Can I teach you all today? So I'm driving down the street, and this is this this is this will bless you. So I'm, I'm not driving down. I'm driving down I-10. We're headed back, and um, all of a sudden, in my in my heart, the Holy Spirit said to me, "You do not know what manner of spirit you are of." Not me. He gave. <laughs> He gave me a scripture for you. <laughs> in trying to describe what money personified looks like. And I heard in my heart, and I began, I said, I remember that. And so when I studied it out later on that night, I went to the exact passage. One day, Jesus was going from one place to another, and he wanted to go over here. And he sent his disciples ahead of time, as he often would do. And they said, um, you know, they, you know we're, Jesus is about to come in here. And it was like, is that Jesus? Yeah, we don't want him to come here. And they went back and told Jesus, and two of the disciples spoke up. And when the disciples, James and John, saw that they said, Lord, they, they said to Jesus, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? They were like, oh, you don't want us to? Jesus, you want us to call fire? Oh, you don't know who you messing with. <laughs> right? They, they go off. They were like, Jesus, they don't, they're rejecting you. Man, do you want us to take care of this for you? And Jesus said to them, he turned, and this wasn't just all guys. All guys, don't worry about it. They, I mean, no. He turned to them something serious. He got up on them or he rebuked them. Come on, y'all got to get this. Walk with Jesus through this. Why? Because something is happening. He said, you do not.
not know at this moment what kind of spirit you are of. See, the Bible talks about that you can be led by the spirit. Now, there are both good spirits and evil spirits. We are spiritual beings, so if you're saved, then you're a good spirit being. Good comes out of the good treasury of your heart. Angels created by God that serve God are good, but demons are bad. Demons are evil. But one thing we know is that you can be spiritually led one way or the other. You know, you, I remember Dwayne Wade, um, he was, uh, had a basketball career. I think it was like a Sprite commercial, and it was like, obey your thirst, right? And so he's coming up the court, and he's got two little Dwayne Wades on his shoulders, right? And he's trying to figure out what, y'all, y'all ain't never, oh, come on now. Y'all help me. Now I'm making all the moves, and I'm tired. And so the, the good Dwayne Wade was like, you know, just go around and just do a layup. And, uh, and, and the bad Dwayne Wade was, you know, go up and dunk it or whatever. You know, you get the idea. How many of y'all know you can be influenced? Romans 8 and 14 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. John Maxwell said that leadership is influence. And a part of leadership is influence because, you know, if somebody... Uh, takes a gun and says, stick them up. They're influencing you to give them, give them your wallet, but that ain't leadership. Come on, right. right? But a part of leadership is influence. And if you are being led by the Spirit, you're also being influenced by the Spirit. Could it be where money is concerned that you are not being led by God or influenced by God where money is concerned you're being influenced by mammon. Oh, it's getting quiet now. Don't go back to quiet now. <sighs> I want to use uh, Brother Egerton, Brother Jonathan, come up. So you be the bad influence. We're always picking on Brother Everton. You be the good influence. So God knows the thoughts that he thinks towards Jonathan. They're thoughts of peace and prosperity for his family, for his children, for his business, for his life, for his health. And God wants to lead, lead Jonathan to a good place. But notice the Lord is a good shepherd, not a good cowboy. A shepherd leads and a cowboy drives. So even though the will of God is very clear for Jonathan's life, the Lord is not going to force him. Back up a little bit. Just a little bit. Not going to force him where he wants to go. Okay, go back, go back. Then you've got a bad influence. Go ahead. Now, now watch. If Jonathan allows, I want you to allow it. <laughs> he can be led in a different direction than what God wants for his life. If he allows, somebody say, if he allows. Give them a hand clap as they sit down. Okay. I want you to keep that illustration in mind. We're going to wrap up in a few minutes. I need a little extra time because I'm tired and I'm not as focused, not as sharp. I just need a little bit more time. But I need you to get this because that's the picture of you. You're being influenced and you don't know what manner of spirit you are. You think God is influencing you, but it's mammon. It's absolutely mammon. Well, how do you determine if it's mammon that's influencing you? I've got a series of questions that I want you to prayerfully consider. Not just today. Don't run through this mess. Do you know how many unsuccessful Christians there are? Folks so called to be saved, but they're struggling in life. Struggling in relationships. Struggling financially. Struggling in their body. Struggling. That shouldn't be. Why? Could it be that they're trying to so serve God and mammon and they don't know it? Don't 
be too quick with this answer. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus deals with his subject. My question to you is, could you be serving mammon and not know it? Let me ask you, who influences your money, God or mammon? So we know what that image of money personified looks like. If, jump up here, Brother, uh, brother Egerton, who influences money in your life? Do you do with money what God wants you to do? Do you give when God says give? Because he won't, he won't force you. You don't got to. But if you want, I want you to do this with your money. It won't make you, right? Thank you. So to help you determine if you're serving God or mammon, I want, you to, I want to ask you, who influences your money decisions? One of the big testing points is the tithe. So another way to answer, ask that question is, do you tithe? Do you give God 10% of your income? And I'm not talking about 10% when you come. <laughs> do, you got, do you give God 10% of your income? Well, Pastor, I thought you just said last week we ain't got a tithe. Yeah, I did say that. You don't got a tithe. You should, but you don't have to. That's a personal decision between you and the Lord. But to help you determine if you serve God and mammon or are trying to, because you can't do it successfully, let me ask you about 10% of your income. Do you tithe? Why? Because God wants you to. I got one right. Mm. That's, why I, that's why he gave me this scripture for you. <laughs> so check this out. He said, woe to you Pharisees, Luke eleven forty two. 42. For you tithe on mint, rue, and all manners of herbs, and you pass by judgment and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Are you tithing? Are you letting God direct your finances? Or do you do with your money what someone else says? What the bank says? What the creditor says? Oh, I'm preaching good. Do you give it to them when they say, give it to me? Or do you give it to God when, according to his word, what he says and what he influences you to do? So if you are here and are like most Christians in the country that do not tithe, I submit to you, you might be serving mammon and don't know it. Okay, let me break it down. We're, we're, we're in the income tax time. And so we know what our annual income is. Clearly calculate. If you move the decimal, if you made $100,000 in 2018, if you are a tither, then you've, you should have given at least $10,000 to an organization that is preaching the word of God. Some pastors preach that the tithe belongs to the local church. Well, it doesn't belong to the local church. It belongs to God. And it can be given through the local church. Now, don't get me wrong. Faith Family Church is supported by the tithes and offerings of those that give. We would not be able to do what we do in preaching a powerful word of God without the tithes and offerings of the people. When you look back at the original design of tithing in the Old Testament, that's how the priests were able to serve in the, in, the, in, the, in the temple and worship the Lord. Oh, it gets quiet when you talk about this. But to help you, this is how you deal with it. And I'm not talking about, you know, I tithe my time. You know, to me, if I serve on a volunteer team, you know, my mom. My time is money. And so, I'm not, 
talking, I'm talking about doing it the way God says. Again, well, I tithe by, 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 by you know, helping and, and giving to the poor. No, that's not a tithe. The Bible says if you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord, he's going to pay you back. A tithe is what it is, and you ain't got a tithe. You don't have to, but the question is, it, do you tithe? If you don't, then could it be that you don't let God influence your money? Why? Because God wants you to. Oh, man, I'm getting a lot of pushback. Okay, let me, let me help you with he wants you to. Jesus was dealing with the Pharisees. The Pharisees said, for, they, they were tithing. And uh, he said, woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint, rue, and herbs. These are three different things. Like if they had a mint garden, they were so specific that if they had 10 bundles of mint that came out, they would take one bundle and take it to the church or the synagogue. If they had rue, if they had five, they took, you know, one of the five. Or, you know, they took 10% of that. I should have stayed with 10. Amen. If they had herbs... They took a tenth of the herb, but then they weren't doing some other things that were more important than tithing. They were passing over justice. They were passing over the love of God. And Jesus said, these you ought to have done. In other words, you should have been tithing on those three things, but you shouldn't leave these two things undone. So God, through Jesus, said, You ought to tithe. That doesn't mean you have to. It means you should. But the issue is, you know, there's so many people push against it because you're not tithing. And so you try to find in your mind all the reasons and excuses that your life should be okay with God without you allowing him to influence you. And you're sitting up here and in your mind, you're thinking of all the reasons why this message has a problem. When God is, you ain't got to, you get to. But you're, you're, something is influencing your thoughts. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, oh, I knew we were going there, somebody said. God said to the people in verse 8, he said, will a man rob God? And and, and like I said with you, you know, oh, I serve God. Do you? They thought they did. As a matter of fact, would a man rob? How many of you are robbing God? Nobody's going to raise their hand to that question. Why? Because in your mind, you don't think you are. They didn't think they were. He said, but yet you have robbed me. And it was like, okay, they were robbing him and didn't know it. You know not what manner of spirit you're of. You're being influenced by the wrong forces. Money personified is influencing what you do with money. Where have we robbed him? He says specifically. See, if you just give 10,000 and you earned 100,000, you're robbing God of the of opportunity to bless you based on the offering which is above the tithe. Of course, he said you're a curse with a curse. He was talking to the nation of Israel. I don't believe that the believer is cursed because you cannot curse what God has blessed. And if we are believers, according to Ephesians 1 and 3, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, whether we tithe or don't tithe. So calm down. Don't get mad at me. If you're sitting up here, you know, like, Pastor, it's already Pastor Tom, and I'm not really receiving this because I got, I got a lot of questions. And a matter of fact, I, I'm not yet a member yet, so that's why I'm not tithing. Because... <laughs> Man, well, who said you got a tie based on the membership? Got all kind of things, and you working in your mind, well, I'm going to do this with the tie. Gonna... No, it belongs to the Lord, and you put it. He said, that, he said in the next verse, he said, bring the tithes into the storehouse so that there may be meat in my house. And he's not talking about brisket and chicken <laughs> and the home bank. Come on. No, he's talking about so when you come, you can have some real spiritual food that'll stick to your ribs. Come on, somebody. That'll help you live a victory. Jesus said, I have food to eat that you know not of. He also said, man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And he said, if any man speak, let him speak of as the very oracles of God. And then if any man minister, let him do it by the ability that God gives, that God may be glorified. Your tithe doesn't belong to your your cousin who's broke. 
I just believe in helping and, and this and that. And I, you know, you need to slow down because it's personified and you are directing what you want to do rather than what God said to do. Okay, I'm almost done. So there are some tithers here. I don't want to exempt you from considering yourself. There's many tithers of faith family church. But I don't want you to just run through it that, well, because I tithe, I don't serve mammon. There's still some more questions that will help you examine whether you're bowing down and don't know it. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? The Lord is trying to influence you to treat your wife better. Yeah, you tithe them, but you talk to her like she's. That was just support from an unmarried person. Amen. <laughs> Looking out for the rest of the ladies and the married men. Amen. He says, why? Why call me Lord? Lord means master, ruler, one in authority. You can't have two masters. If I'm your master, you do what I tell you to do. You serve and you worship me. Let me ask you this question. You can come up and play soft. Sorry to say that. <laughs> Who dictates? Here's the question. Get this in your spirit. Who? I'm closing with this. Who dictates what you do with money? Yeah, you tithe. All right, that's cool. But who dictates what you do with money? Imagine again, we're trying to get, get Jonathan to where, where he got two influences. God who's trying to lead him in the right way, but there's this other thing that Jesus is describing as money personified. Are you letting God direct your finances or do you do with your money what someone else says? Here's the big question. Are you mammon? in your life. Are you letting God direct your finances or do you do with, with your money what someone else says? Who are they who is mammon in your life? Here's a big one. Are your children mammon? I wanted to see reactions on that. Them little rascals they look like money personified. Little bitty diapers and little bitty clothes and little bitty everything. My finances have taken a hit. It costs money to give them birth. Got to feed them and clothe them and give them a place to sleep. And then now you got to, you know, my wife handed me a little slip with a number written on from a, a daycare cost or what it would be if we signed them up. I'm like, no, you can keep staying home and keep them. Are you bringing me this kind of number? $136 every week? Where are we going to get that from? Every week? That's for the month? No, that's every week. That's $500 a month. Come on, I'm, I'm being real, and, I, and I'm sorry that we're pushing and pulling today with each other. But if you really want to get where God wants you to be, you can't do it in two directions. Who is mammon? In your life. Yeah, are you tithing? Are your children mammon? Are you mammon to you? How many of y'all like self-serve ice, ice cream? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Full service gas station and self-serve. For so many, mammon is you. You are money personified. And you influence your own decisions with money. And he said you can't serve God and self-serve. So if you want more of this, come back. If not, wait a few weeks. I'll be on to a different subject. <laughs> Stand up on your feet. Try to say the comical right at the close time. I'm getting ready to let you go. I do love you. I really do. Um, I believe this church turned a corner on June 11th 
in 2018. The church was living paycheck to paycheck. Can I be real? In other words, from week to week. And it's just like a, a strain to believe God without asking for help. I'm talking about back then. It's a different, different place now. And I was struggling in my heart. And the Bible says, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you where you don't have to worry about what you're going to wear and what you're going to do and how you're going to do this. But I wasn't doing it right. And the thing that the Lord touched me and my heart about was the tithe from faith family to other churches. Check this out. I was assuming the tithe for the church. You know, there's about, you know, $24,000 that comes in in a month. So I would put us on a pattern to do about $2,400 in giving to other churches and ministry for the month. It wasn't being specific. And so I'm driving down the road and I, I get this overwhelming direction to be accurate and diligent to tithe on every deposit that comes into the church's account. Accurate and diligent. I had never, I, I'm, I'm the kind of person that I would round my, my tithe up to the next dollar. There's some people that, you know, if they got $1,234.56, they would give $123.47. I mean, they would get it to the penny. You know, for me, I was thinking that the, the Pharisees did it that way. I mean, they were very diligent and very particular where the tithe was. And notice, this is what hit my heart. He said, you ought to do that. I don't know who I'm helping. I'm helping somebody. Maybe it's on the Internet. Amen. And so from that day to this, Faith Family Church tithes on every single deposit that comes into the church's account. And from that day to this, we're in a better position as a congregation in every area, including financially, and I believe it's tied first to honoring God with our substance. So I challenge you, as you go through this week, don't just take my word for it. Don't let it be something that I describe. Don't just, you know, feel the pressure and the pinch. Talk to the Lord about it. Am I serving mammon? What is mammon in my life? Am I directing my own money? Are my children influencing my money? Are, are my relatives, you know, when they know I got a little something and then they call me and I always help them out. And in my mind, that's like the tithe. So, you know, God, I, you know. Who's influencing? Is it the banker? Is it the creditor? Et cetera, et cetera. Amen. Um, Bow your heads. I, I want to pray over you concerning this. Father, over this next week, I ask you to help every one of us, including me, to see if there's mammon personified, mammon in our lives. Reveal it to us. Help us to make adjustments. If there's something that you're leading us to do where tithes and offering and money is concerned, in general, whether it be saving money or investing it, and, and we've not been listening to you, show it to us. Show us where we went wrong. We're asking that in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. I'm going to ask that Brother Egerton come up here for a moment. Last night, after getting here, I, I had folks in my car. He had folks in his car. Come up here and stand with me. Uh, so all of us drove back. My brother, he pulled the trailer back, and I, I really appreciate that. It made a difference. I want to tear it. I, I don't believe in debt, so I got to hold on to that truck for a minute here. We, we, we come on, we get all back, and he dropped the kids off at the church. He went home, and he laid down at 3.30. I got home. Uh, I, I, had to, I had to stop, get some things. And I finally get to the house, maybe about 5, say hi to my wife. One of my sons was there. The other one was away. I haven't really seen him yet. And I told her, I said, well, I need to go up to the church because Brother Demetrius, you know, had a surgery, and he normally sets up these sound systems. I taught him how to do it. I know he's not going to be there, and I, I gave him my word that I'd, I'd make sure it gets done. So I knew I had to do that. Plus, you know, I believe that we need to reach the community that we're in with the gospel of Jesus. So I know we just got these flags, and I wanted to get them up, so I, I figured it wouldn't take that long. So I got here, 
at 6.48. Ricky was here at 6.30, setting up by himself. I don't know where the rest of the guys, I don't know, some of them went to camp, but some of them didn't go to camp, amen. But he was by himself, and he set up the whole church. And I'm thinking, like, Brother Egerton should be here by 7.30 at least. I got there lure, so I came in at about 7, about an hour after that, so 7.45. And then about 15 minutes after that, he came in, and he said, I'm sorry, Pastor, I was asleep. I slept the whole time. I said, that's all right, Brother Ricky got it, and he, we tuned out a few other things. And it's like, all right, well, I'm going to head on back. And then he looked at the speakers. The speakers were in place, but they weren't connected. Are you about to do that? And I said, yes, sir. Very few people know how to connect them. I know how to connect them. Are you about to stay and do that? I said, yes, sir. Oh, you're not going to send me away, are you? I know he doesn't know how to help me, but he just wanted to keep me company. So faithful. And uh, so I said, yeah, you can stay. Just give me a minute. He had to run and take care of something and then come right back. So he came right back. But while he was gone, I put on some music while I was setting up the wires. And I'm meditating. And I'm excited because of what God showed me while I was driving back to minister to you. I knew it would be tough. But something happened. God asked me to bring him up here. He turned 70 on Thursday, right? This past Thursday. And God showed me something to do at the end of the service that I have never, ever done in my life as a pastor. I saw a vision of him standing up here receiving and that we as a congregation was so into his life. I thought, yeah, yeah, I thought it was the devil. Right? I'm thinking like, really God? We have never put a person in that place. Now, of course, you know, the tithe and offering, that belongs to the Lord. But just if you want to be a blessing, anybody know what a Holy Ghost handshake is? Back in the day, you know, you shake somebody's hand and leave something in it. So I'm thinking in my, I'm thinking, in, you know, we could just do a little something. And then the Lord shows me that faith family is supposed to give him a gift as a group. And we wrote a big check. Gave it to him at the 830 service. I shared the same message, and I told the congregation, I said, if you want to just be a blessing to a brother who's been a blessing to us, the Bible says in Galatians 6 and 10, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. We have an opportunity today directed by the Lord to be a blessing. Whether you shake his hand and just say, you know, we love you, we thank you, if you want to give specifically different than what you've already done for the church, you can put it in the offering receptacle, but you got to write on there E.J. Egerton Jervis. That's too long. Just put E.J. Okay, if you want to be a blessing to him. And remember, you don't have to. The church has already done a ton, right? Never feel, I don't know what the needs are in his life, but I know I have needs. Everybody has needs, right? But you're not supposed to give out of necessity. And you're not supposed to give grudgingly. If you don't want to give, God bless you, no worries. We'll see you next week, really, and it's okay. Amen? But if you want to be a blessing, you have an opportunity. If you are visiting, I'd love to greet and meet you. My wife made some oatmeal cookies. We'll be over in the fellowship hall. I'd love to see you back next week. I apologize for going long. I'm tired, not as focused, not as sharp. Please forgive me. Raise your hand. Let me speak a word of blessing over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance and give you his grace. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.